Hola amigos, this is Billy Sheehan, your bass player. You're listening to me right here on South Detroit Soundhouse. Hey all, welcome back to South Detroit Soundhouse. My name is Randy Falsetto. We're here at the Token Lounge in Westland, Michigan with none other than the biggest, baddest bass player in the entire planet. Somebody here? Mr. Billy Sheehan. Very kind of you. Nice to meet you, Billy. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Today. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Our pleasure. Listen, right. uh, just, you know, we're going to go through a little history and then talk, talk about today, but Talis, David Lee Roth, uh, Mr. Big, Winery Dogs. Uh, I mean, what a career so far, right? Like, uh, how's life? Uh, well, I'm very, very, uh, very grateful. I've had a lot of great opportunities, play with some amazing people. We've got uh, incredible fans all over the place, and it uh, doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. How's, uh, how was it um, growing up in Buffalo, by the way? Did you ever think that you would uh, escape from Buffalo? Was it uh, something? Well, I never that looked at it. I wasn't trying to escape so much. Uh, it's true that uh, there was a point in time when doing the grind of constant playing and really getting nowhere wore on you a little bit. But in retrospect, actually, that was great, great training. Being in a band, uh, a copy band, playing in clubs are what the greatest bands and greatest musicians in the world. That's how all of them started. The Beatles, Van Halen, ACDC, all these great bands. That's how they did it. So at the time, you may not... You know, if somebody's watching this at home and has got a gig tonight at a bar where they got to go play four hours of cover songs and they're hating life, well, hold on a second. It's great, great training. I mean, you learn so much. And it also set the tone for me uh, in the early days because there were no dressing rooms. Uh, clubs, we just step off the front of the stage of the club into the crowd after our set and hang out with people and talk. And there's no security or anything like that. And uh, we look up at the clock, time to go. So we take our beer, go up on stage and play some more and repeat. So we got uh, this great relationship with the people in the audience from the early days. And we kept that alive through all the bands and all the situation I've been in, which was led to just having a lot of friends all over the world. And wherever we go, there's, I know somebody. <laughs> and it's, uh, it, it really makes it good. So the training uh, in the early bar uh, copy band days, as grueling as it might have been to some degree, well, we had fun too. It was great fun and it was really uh, learned so many valuable lessons. Yeah. Was the uh, was summer of '85, big uh, big season, big year for you with David Lee Roth? Obviously, when, when that all exploded, was that? Can I say this? Um, was it really the? I hate to use the word turning point in your career, but was it the springboard to everything well, yeah. that came after that? It was. It was a turning point. Uh, tell us, uh, at the time, actually, had gotten signed by a small label. Um, we got an agency deal. We got, uh, things were starting to go a little bit, but we had just kind of, the original tiles had broken up and I reformed with four pieces. So it was kind of like a new band again, so we had to start all over again. It was pretty frustrating. Then they changed the uh, drinking rules in New York State, I think from 18 to 21. So the bar business dropped by 40% right away. So mm -hmm. everybody's pay uh, got cut. And so it was, a, it was a difficult time. And then the call came in. Dave flew me out to LA and said, I want to start a band. I said, okay, I'm in. And uh, we, uh, I, I was just starting a tour and uh, finished that tour, got done, and then he, he flew me out. And that was it. I, was, uh, I lived in Los Angeles then, so it was, I'm, I'm forever grateful to him for giving me the, a great opportunity. And I'm, I, I hope to think that I contributed to his uh, situation there and helped make the Eat Him and Smile thing happen. Yeah, well, the band was incredible. I mean, you, Steve Vai, and Greg Bissonette. I mean, it was just, a, it was just, you know, who was Van Halen? I mean, forget it, you know, it was, right? But <laughs> well, um, we love how, how did that, like, how did, where did that phone call come from? Like, I mean, I know it came from Dave, but how did it find its way to you? Uh, it, Dave's uh, manager called uh, my office. But I had been in touch with the Van Halens uh, through the years. After our first time, uh, Talis, the Buffalo band, opened up for Van Halen in 1980. Eddie gave me his phone number and said, you know, keep it quiet and stuff like that. And for years, I didn't talk about this because Michael is awesome. Michael Anthony, great guy, great player, amazing singer. And I felt bad about it that the band was kind of asked, talking to me and uh, about the possibilities of replacing him. Now, as years go by, I don't even really know why they wanted me in the band. 
Michael is the guy, you know. But I was very flattered that they spoke to me at all. But, but I love all those guys. I, 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 I'm the only person in the world who's played with every member of Van Halen. Wow, incredible! Every single I one. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm sure I play with know Sammy. I play with Gary Sharon. I play with that. I play with Al. I play with Michael, uh, and I play with Wolfie. Uh, but uh, it wasn't music. I, w I was on a plane flight with Ed, and he had Wolfie with him, and Ed wanted to sleep, so I. I did some, some number and spelling games with Wolfie. And Ed would look up and go, man, you're going to make a good father. Say, I'm having a hard enough time with my cat. Thank you. Um, well, back to, um, back to you know, more about you and your career. Uh, voted best bass player, guitar player, magazine five years straight. You know, I hate to ask this question, but it's, you know, it's, it's been, you know, um, been in interviews uh, so many times. But who were your influences growing up? Uh, everybody and anything. Anywhere. I mean, it wasn't just bass players. It was songs and music. Uh, it was singers, piano players, sax players, uh, a lot of things. So as far as bass players go, of course, uh, the Beatles kind of launched about 20 million careers, I would imagine, all over the world. I got, I got uh, copy bands and bands from the 60s, the garage band era. There's, there are hundreds of thousands of tracks that were recorded all over the world because the Beatles came out and they yeah. did everybody wanted to. So Paul McCartney would, would have to be uh, in a chronological order, one of the very first. But okay. uh, Tim Boger, Jack Bruce, John, Ellis, so the usual suspects, all the, the best guys that we all know, they all had an influence on me. But also uh, bands and Hendrix and uh, Wes Montgomery and Oscar Peterson and all kinds of guys. Yeah, it's a it's a list. I usually make that the illegal question because it's so it's so there's so many to list. We could spend the next two hours. Exactly. Um, sometimes you're referred to as the lead bassist. You ever heard this before? Where you're, so I guess some people consider you playing a lead instrument, being the guy in, who's holding down the bottom end. Did you ever take offense to that, or was there any? Well, it's just yep. simply not true. They just aren't. They just aren't aware enough of bass and what it does, mm -hmm. and uh, what the left hand is on a Bach, uh, well-tempered clavier. The, 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 it's moving. Paul McCartney, a little help from my friends all over the place. James Jamerson and all Motown songs. The most active m melodic musical amount of notes is the bass. It's the bass, and uh, people with a limited uh, understanding of music see a guitar player playing a bunch of notes, mm -hmm. and then they call it a lead. They, re they call it a lead because he's a lead guitarist. So we played this thing. So we'll, the name of that thing must be a quote unquote lead, complete mislabeling. So when anyone else plays a couple of notes, <laughs> a piano player, a sax player, they go, oh, look, he's playing lead on sax. Completely backwards and, and, and wrong. I play with a drummer. I do what bass is supposed to do. I also do some other things, not unlike, hopefully, uh, not to compare myself with him, but uh, someone like John Atlas or Chris Squire or John Wetton or Stanley Clark or Jaco Pastoris. They're, they're, you, know, you, you play in the song, but you're, there's also a lot of other notes you can do in the meantime. And a lot of times the bass solo thing, uh, it was great for the rest of the band to take a break. Yeah. They would be doing a hard gig and the singer's got to rest the voice, bass solo. <laughs> he goes back, has a little drink of water, and we keep on going. So, yeah. you know, I... Uh, I, I appreciate it if it's meant in a positive way, but a, uh, a lot of times people try to dismiss what they fear, and they think that you know my, I'm I'm playing aggressive bass in order to beat them up. Yeah. I'm not. I'm just doing my thing, and I love your thing, and I love simple bass players. Bass player from ACDC, amazing. Yes, you know? uh, there's a lot of a lot of great ways to play bass, and in Nashville they say there's no money above the net, the fifth fret. So it's very <laughs> yeah, that's very well said. Keep uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm looking at your tour schedule, and uh, you've got a busy summer coming up, yep. uh, Mr. Big, obviously, and then um, uh, Winery Dogs in the fall. So there's, some, there's a space there in July, though, that's absent. Is there something going on in July that uh, you're not touring? Any reason for that? I'm not sure what happened. I think it was a couple scheduling things that happened with a few of the guys. I'm going to do one show in Rochester, New York, uh, with the version 2 Talus. Oh, uh, cool. I think, it's, I think it's a charity show. We're doing it, I think, J July 19th. And then... Uh, a few other things. I have some recording stuff booked as well. But uh, yeah, we'll be picking right up. We'll be going, we may be going into 2018 a little bit too, because of response to the record and all that. It's been very good. Yeah. But towards the end of the year, we're going to start writing for Winery Dogs. I'm not sure when we'll do that record, but it's going to be as soon as possible. Okay. okay. 
but I, I'm glad I got two bands that I can work in that have a, a nicely staggered schedule. Because yeah. I live to play live, and I gotta, I, I gotta be on stage. So when uh, when Mr. Big can't play, luckily, and I love playing with the Winder Dogs live. Mm -hmm. It's so, so much fun playing with Richie and Mike. So yeah. I'm, it's a it's a good thing. Wow. Well, I have like a ton of questions about Defying Gravity, so we have to talk about this. Okay. So the brand new album, Defying Gravity, it's already out, correct? No, it's uh, July 7th. July 7th, okay, July 7th. So it's done, it's all finished, just ready for... Yes, sir. For, okay, uh, six days to make this thing. So is that, I, I you know I've, I've seen on a couple of uh, uh, videos about you saying, well, you know, you've done albums in one day, three days, yeah. six, say, six days for this one. Yeah. So it was, was it like, was it, um, you say you work better under pressure, I think, is what you said in that video. Yeah, it's a good, a good kind of pressure. Yeah. Like, you if, you, if you have 90 days to do a record, on day 89, you'll be almost done. Yeah. Where if you have 10 days, you, you'll get it done, you know? And if you have uh, a huge budget of money to do any project, you'll lose, use it right up to the last dollar <laughs> instead of, you know, using the reasonable amount and then giving the rest of the money back or yeah. doing something with it. So it's just human nature, I think. So... Yeah, we did all the basics in six days, and just not to uh, uh, to clarify that there were other things that were recorded. We had to do background vocals that took us about three days, um, and Eric did the lead vocals uh, for about I don't know maybe seven seven to ten days on his own up in uh, San Francisco, and uh, and the mixing took a little while too. So. Uh, but the basics, guitar, bass, drums, arrangements of the song, every, the foundation that anything else was going to be put on had to be done. We only had six days where we were all in the, were all in the same city. Yeah. So we had to get it done. There was no choice. And so the last day, we knew we needed to get two songs. We had one. We launched it on another one. It wasn't working, wasn't working. So I forgot which one it was, but then somebody came up, well, let's go with this one. And, we, and each song was just a couple little pieces we had to kind of assemble. And we did, and it came out well. And we were, okay. we, this, we could stop sweating <laughs> but it was a good kind of pressure well i mean, I mean there was a uh, little clip there that i saw that said something about you guys not seeing each other for six months so you came together not you know being in each other's presence for that amount of time and all of a sudden you guys are putting an album together is that hard to do yeah well uh we pat lives in la still eric's in san francisco paul's in portland so we you know i see pat often and I see Paul, you know, at a, we, we, we cross paths a lot and stuff like that, but we haven't sat down together as a band working on anything. But Paul flew in uh, two or three times for us to sit around myself, Pat, and Paul and do it like we did in the old days, get together in a room, work up some parts, get a, uh, get a rough thing of it on tape, send it up to Eric. He listens down, figures what he can do with what, sings a couple things, send it back to us. So that'll work okay. But that, that song isn't done. It's just we got these three parts and they fit together and it's going to work okay. Next one. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way we've done uh, most of our records from the beginning. Uh, we, 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 Paul, Pat, and myself get together and come up with ideas and then we send it up to Eric and he, he takes it from there. Like a live and kick it on Lean Into It record. Paul was doing this, this kind of tuning thing. I said, Paul, what key is that in? You know, Gee, what if him, Pat tried it? And we started playing a, a thing to that kind of riff yeah. and then to, uh, came with a couple changes, sent it up to Eric as is, and he wrote the lyrics, live and kicking. Bang, that was wow. so, that's kind of how we did it. So we've done it like that a lot in the past, so it wasn't yeah. that uh, unusual for us. Yeah, your, uh, your music's very technical, yet it's hooky, which is really hard to do. Is that something that comes organically, or did you guys, you know, when you created Mr. Big, was it something that you guys set out to do to, to have these blistering chops in your songs, yet, you know, remain something that could be on the radio? You know, um, it's funny because we often get uh, questions about what our plan was. We had this plan to do this. We, <laughs> we thought it through, and we, we just, we were there, <laughs> and try this, okay. We, we, and we never discussed, you know, how we we're gonna do it or what we should, should we put a lot of notes in or not? It was, it was just kind of, we let it happen organically and all of us are fans. And that's the most important thing, I think, because as a fan, I don't go home and listen to complicated music. Mm -hmm. I'll put on Bad Company nice. or, you know, song, there's a great singer and a great song. Maybe there'd be like a, a solo or two, but I don't go home and listen to like instrumental music ever, <laughs> really, unless it's uh, classical music. Then I'll listen to that. So we wanted to do music that we would love and love to play live and be able to play live, but also that would we feel because we're fans, we're not so different from other fans. If it, if it pleased us, it may please others, and luckily it did. So we, um, we, 
we like, and I, I've always liked a little bit of a balance. Like I hear a great song, and the solo or some other change comes in, and it's it's way underplayed. I think, what, you could have done so much more here. It could have been a cool way to reprise the vocal melody and kind of harmonize it, and then go back in the chorus and modulate. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. Well, there's more you can do, but it doesn't make it disinteresting or complicated or or. Uh, what we would call it also woman repellent music. It was, it was referred to many times because you go to those shows and it's all guys. And That's like, right. I see that where the guys in Rush said that uh, when we opened up for them, it was the first time they saw girls in the first 10 rows and, and since they started. So they were happy about that. I'm kidding, of course. But no, that actually happened. Uh, but we, we wanted music that we liked. That, and we, wanted, we didn't want to pander to people. But we wanted them to like what we did. You know, we wanted to do something that they would like, that they would, it would turn them on, be exciting. How many times I, I heard a new song or a new record by somebody, I go, wow, this is awesome, I love it, so great. I'd love to do that. If I made a record, somebody got it, wow, this is awesome. That's, that was kind of our goal more than anything. Yeah. Not, not trying to meet out uh, what, what notes where and how and have this grand plan or scheme. I wish we were, I wish we were that smart. Yeah. Maybe we... Uh, We'd be much better off if we were, but no, we, this is all we got to work with. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of uh, of goals, um, do you have any, ex any expectations for the, s the sales of the album? Like, I mean, you know, I'd like to talk about the music business as well with you, and things have changed yeah, so I, much that no expectations at all. If uh, people get it and they like it, we're happy. We make most of our uh, income from live performance, yeah. and records now are kind of a a little parallel side to that. Um, well, it would be great to have another hit, you know, that'd be fantastic. The first one changed our lives yeah. completely. But um, I'm cool. I'm, I'm okay. You know, if, if the record does a couple thousand units and people are happy, I'm glad. If it does a couple million and people are happy, I'm maybe a little more glad, of course. <laughs> of course, who, who wouldn't want a more success and, you know, an easier time of it? But um, we don't, we're not really looking to uh, uh, score. And none of us have ever been mo money motivated. You know, I've never got into music to get rich or make money or get famous. I love music and I love playing. And that's the most important thing to me. Yeah. Um, favorite track off the, uh, off the new album. Can you talk about it? Do you have a favorite track? Be Kind. Why? It's got an incredibly sweet and timely message for everybody in the world, no matter what situation you're in, that to simply be kind because you don't understand what someone else might be going through. Yeah. So why not? bring a little kindness into the world. Sounds like a simple, maybe a trite uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, sentiment, but I think it's extremely important, especially now we live in a world of chaos, turmoil, yeah. hatred, and lunacy. Uh, be kind is, is a nice uh, way to uh, simplify an approach that will certainly make the world a better place. I really want to have your uh, opinion on the whole industry. I'm, I'm a real big, real big fan of what's going on and what's gone on in the last you know, 20 years. Um, it's changed drastically. You, you know because you've been in uh -huh. the 70s, 80s, 90s, now 2000s. So in your opinion, how, how has the music industry changed for not Mr. Big, not Winery Dogs, but for Billy Sheehan? How has it changed for you? Well, more emphasis on live performance now, which I love. That's what I do. That's my favorite thing. You can't download a live performance. You can download a video of it, but you can't download the experience of being in a room, a hot, sweaty room with all your friends and hear music and everybody cheer together and have that excitement. Nothing like it. I mean, you can watch football games on TV, too. And you got the on-field camera and the on-field mic, and you're right up in the action. But still people go to football games because there's nothing like being in a crowd of people and, and doing your thing. So... Yeah, the music business has changed, but I think it's changed uh, uh, accordingly. You know, I think uh, albums cost too much. Bands were taking advantage of the situation. I think there was a lot of fakery and trickery with the uh, recording. Mm -hmm. A lot of bands mm -hmm. couldn't perform live what they were doing in the studio. Yep. And uh, Mr. Big has always been against that. Winery Dogs, every band I've ever been in, it's been real. You know, there's no tracks. We don't have tracks. We sing for real. We play for real. And that's, that's it. So the way that it's uh, coming about now, uh, I'm kind of happy about it. Okay. It's kind of, it, it's, it's real. And it's like it was like in the early 60s too. I mean, uh, the Everly Brothers down in Philly, they, they sang and played. Mm -hmm. And when they recorded, they just went in and sang and played their songs in the studio. They didn't, they didn't take it all apart and reassemble it all and it with some uh, you know, recording magic. It was two mics and Don and Phil. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I thought, and some of the, and those records, they still play those records today. Yeah. So I'm, uh, there's so many great advantages today, too. You're a couple of clicks away from a billion people. Yeah. Easy. You know, anybody with a laptop, you've got the equivalent of more than the equivalent of um, 
a $100 million studio. Because now you can do even more than that $100 million studio could do in the 70s. Way more than, than they could do. And uh, uh, distribution uh, digitally is easy and better. And so there are a lot of great advantages to it, yeah. too. I was an early adopter of all things yeah. digital, so I, yeah. I, I did like that. Yeah. But, uh, but also, you know, just, just as far as being a player goes, that's what's happening now. And it may not be as big, and there may not be people getting rich and famous off it, but I'm, we're going to play tonight in front of, there's only 550 tickets sold, it'll probably sell out, mm -hmm. and we're going to have a riot. I know. It's going to be great. Yeah. And on this whole run we're doing, I think we're going to probably break even. I don't think we'll actually even make money on the tour, quite frankly. You know what? I'm good. I'm How are cool. you good with that? Hmm? How are you good with that? Uh, I'm okay. Well, I'll make, I'll get something somewhere. You know, we'll do our international uh, uh, traveling and touring is much more lucrative for us. Okay. So but that's fine. But I'm playing. I, I'm, I'm good with that. You know, yeah. I, like I said, I'm not in this for the money. Yeah. The crew gets paid. We're glad about that. Okay. They work much harder than we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just mentioned um, uh, that you like the live, the whole live performance and the Everly Brothers and whatnot. Um, I saw a clip about uh, you know the recording of Defying Gravity, and you were saying it's best to, you know, uh, you did a few albums. Um, um, I can't remember which ones they were, but where you were actually sitting in a room and it was live, it wasn't chopped up. So you said the best atmosphere for recording an album was when there's people actually in the same room with you. Yeah. And can you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, Eat and Smile was done like that. Okay. Uh, all the Talos records were done like that. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, all the Mr. Big records, for the most part. The last one we did, uh, 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 stories we could tell. Unfortunately, we had a situation, our, our drummer Pat has got some uh, medical problems, so he couldn't do a full kit, so we had to actually kind of piece that one together. Okay. And some of it is okay, some of it I'm, I'm not crazy about, but it's the best we could do under the situation. Uh, unfortunately, it was, a, it was a, a sad thing, but you know, Pat's up to speed now, he's doing great, and we're so happy we brought in Matt Starr, a wonderful guy, a great drummer, to do the heavy lifting on the drums, because he you know, it's hard for Pat to be behind a kit, you know, uh, for, for that much time. It's exhausting for him, and it, but, he's, but he's doing good. So uh, this latest record was done more like our early records as well, where we're all in a room, and I could see Matt in the control, you know, in the drum room, and could see Eric through the window, and Paul was next to me in the control room we were playing, and Pat would run out and tell Matt, no, we're on the, do the hi-hat thing, and try the, you know, they do drum talk for 10 minutes, do another <laughs> take, and it was, uh, so it was done very much like, uh, like that. We were all in a room together. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about, you know, you've heard comments from other musicians, other artists that are, you know, relevant today and they're, and they're not in the, in the business of putting out new material and they're relying on, you know, the, the fame and fortune of their, of their past and whatnot. So how do you find putting out an album, Defying Gravity, you know, how do you feel about putting out a new album um, in the market that we're in? Where it's not, I don't want to say that it's not really necessary to put out new music anymore, especially Mr. Big who has a pile of hits. How do you feel about that? <laughs> uh, I just uh, like the idea that um, we lived a lot of life and we all have our own things and we go off and travel and do a lot of things, all kinds of different musical experiences. I just did a thing with uh, uh, 50 steel drummers in a studio and uh, all kinds of experiences we have. So when we come together and start writing and thinking about putting a record together, we're going to have some new idea and some new thing and a new approach and it's going to be different than what we did before. I have no uh, 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 opposition to someone playing their heads. That's, that's what most people want to hear. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. And that's what mostly we do. We play from our other records. We do two new songs because uh, one of them is already getting a lot of action on the internet and we got a lot of requests for it. Is that 1992? Yeah. Yeah. But if we 1992. 1992 check it out. is the one. <laughs> and so we'll probably end up with, I just know myself as a fan if I go see a band they do too many new songs I, I, I don't know this song I, I want to sing along. <laughs> so I understand completely why some bands go well you want to sing to the hits we'll play the hits yeah. that's cool. Yeah. And I know some bands that go out and they don't do any old songs they do only the new ones and the fans are kind of the comments from the fans are like we wanted to hear those songs we love, you know. So we keep that in, in consideration. We, again, we don't pander, but we want people to be pleased, we want to leave happy. And some people want to hear a couple new things, so we'll throw a few in there. And some people, they want to hear Wild World to be with you and yeah. Just Take My Heart and Green Tin Six of Mine and all those. So, and we love playing them still. I really do love those songs. Uh, if you were to see three concerts this summer, what would you see? Oh boy, that's a tough one. I'd want to see, uh, it's a great singer. I love Melody Gardot is her name. I just love her singing. Uh, I've been getting back into Robin Trower again. Yes. I just wish uh, we lost James Dewar, though. What a voice. What a great bass player. So 
but I'm not sure who's singing with him now. I hope he sounds like James Stewart because I just love that. I've been getting into Robin Trower a lot lately. He's just a, just yeah. great. And uh, well, I did see recently uh, uh, Dennis Chambers with Victor Wooten. Uh, oh, okay. And they're wow. both dear friends of mine, and they were just awesome. That was good. That I, Victor's maybe, a killer. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, Brian Adams, maybe. Is he touring? Good Canadian boy. Yeah, I love Brian Adams. He's great. <laughs> we, Mr. Big opened up uh, for Brian Adams for quite a while there in the 90s, and uh, we became uh, friends, and he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. I love his records, but, but I tell him, no, play the hits. Don't play any new stuff. No, I'm kidding. I wouldn't do that. Actually, one of his new songs I saw recently, it was great. It yeah, was really cool. Great artist, so. great artist, great songwriter. Yeah. Yeah. Last question, is rock dead? Uh, no, it's not. Dixieland isn't dead either. Nor is uh, uh, folk music dead. All these genres, at one point they dominated everything, and then they drop into their spot. And you will occasionally see them pop back up again, but they're, it can't go away because it's uh, a whole other generation is listening to what their moms and dads listen to. I listen to what my mom listened to, and it really, uh, I really started to get into it. Uh, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, Mel Torme. Ella Fitzgerald, all these great singers my mom was into. They're, that's part of my collection heavily now. So it's kind of cool. So I know right now, and I see it from people who come and see us play. They bring their little kids, and they've been listening to Mr. Big all day, and they're you know, into it, or Led Zeppelin, or the Beatles, or whatever else. And I'm seeing, uh, as I drive around near my home, there's a bunch of high schools, and when they let out, if I happen to be driving around at 3 or 4 o'clock, I see a lot of kids carrying guitars again. Oh, good. And it's really good noticeable sign. that kids are carrying guitars around. So who knows what the future may bring. Yeah. You think maybe the definition of rock has changed? Um, I think people have kind of balkanized it and split it up. That there's, there's rock, there's hard rock, there's heavy metal, there's the, 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 this rock, that rock, and the other rock. But in the early days, the, the rock stations played everything. Yeah. And it was kind of all rock. So I prefer that rather than splitting things up into those little fences between you know, I like this music, but I hate everything else. You know, I, I, in the early days of concerts, they would put bands on stage of very disparate uh, styles. Uh, Aerosmith opening for the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Wow. You know, things of that nature. Where, and people would go, and they'd like both. You know, people, oh, this is interesting, you know. Now people would be throwing stuff. Kids in Slayer and Metallica shirts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, digging the fast stuff. And then the uh, uh, young teenage girls in braces sing along with To Be With You and Just Take My Heart. But as the show progressed, the kids in the, in the black t-shirts were singing along with To Be With You and the, and the young teenage girls were singing along with Daddy Brother. So we helped to melt that fence apart a little bit. We were very proud of that, uh, kind of breaking down those barriers and having people enjoy the whole show rather than just their one little thing. Yeah. Billy, it has been fantastic my talking pleasure. to my friend. I want you to, thanks very to much. say thanks again for taking the time out. and. Uh, Best on the tour and uh, best on Defying Gravity. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Randy Falsetta. Uh, we'll see you on our next chat. Hola amigos, this is Billy Sheehan, your bass player. You're listening to me right here on South Detroit Soundhouse. Who can do that now? Who can do that in one take, dude? That's crazy. That's crazy. I'm one one take Willie, they call me. <laughs>